So, good evening all of you. This will be a very short presentation and uh, I hope to have uh, more time for uh, interactions rather than go on a monologue. So, um, I guess, is work I don't have to stand here, right? Okay. Um, so, we have had uh, many speakers in the morning session uh, tell us about how half of the world's electricity is consumed by motors. And uh, we had another speaker who said that only 20% of the world's energy is actually electricity. And uh, then we had somebody else say that half of the world's energy goes into uh, things like heating and uh, transport where directly fuel is burnt and there is no um, conversion to electricity involved. So, this sort of puts a perspective. If I look at the total basket of what is energy, 10% uh, is consumed by motors and um, uh, probably another 40% uh, uh, is consumed by directly burning some fuels either in automobiles or for process heat in industry, etc. So, that's the context in which I want you to see the slide. Um, motors Though they are a significant consumer of energy, the, their share in the total energy basket is poised to grow very massively. Uh, heating is one area, heat pumps I have written here, is one area where significant energy uh, efficiency can be brought by using what are called heat pumps. And uh, in fact, that was triggered after the Ukraine war in countries like Germany and other places they suddenly realize that they're just burning gas indiscriminately and it's no longer available and they have made it regulatorily mandatory for people to switch to heat pumps so that there is better energy efficiency in the use of fuel. And uh, areas like transport are going to become increasingly electric. And uh, then there are there is a growing uh, usage of robots at all levels, at domestic uh, level onwards, we have the robots Commonly now, uh, you can see in many houses for sweeping and mopping. There is a restaurant in Chennai where the waiters are robotic. And then there is industrial automation, warehouse uh, material handling, all of this. And uh, according to some uh, leading observers of the trends, in the next 15 years, the population of robots will be more than the human population. That's how rapidly it is expected to grow. And every robot will have at least one motor. Typically, it may have three or four motors. And um, then, of course, drones. So, there are so many new areas of application that motors is coming into that we have to take a serious look at this animal and try to understand uh, what it is, how well is it really performing, are we pushing the boundaries well enough. And so, we, have, we all have motors like these in our houses or in, we have seen it in others' houses. Motors as a domain of knowledge is at least 100 years old. Uh, so why are we today talking about motors as if it's a new and happening uh, technology trend? The main difference between conventional uh, motors and what we expect of motors today is that we want the size to be as small as possible. We want the weight to be as little as possible. We don't want the motor to be noisy. All these considerations did not apply for the water pump in the house. It's kept tucked away in some uh, room. I don't care if it's a little heavier, a little bigger, if it's making some noise. But not if it is right under my uh, seat in an electric vehicle. Uh, and uh, yes, efficiency is very important, uh, mainly because the highest cost component of an electric vehicle is the battery. And uh, the more judiciously the motor is able to utilize the battery, the less it can be sized. So it's an important cost driver. And um, applications like drones, EVs, robots, all of these, they require, uh, they involve sudden changes in the speed, sudden changes in the load, which is unlike what conventional applications of motors were. So control has to be very swift, dynamic, and uh, responsive. And um, the uh, other, of course, important requirement in many applications is that right from starting at zero, uh, 
uh, at zero speed, I need to have the full complement of torque, which many of the conventional motors don't deliver. Even the IC engines don't deliver. That's why we have what's called a clutch. We have to first rev up the engine up to a certain level before we engage the load. Otherwise, they'll just putter and stop. So these are all the demands being placed on motors, which is leading to the uh, different trends that uh, drive the technology. So before that, uh, let me just uh, uh, dwell for a moment on efficiency. Yes, very obviously, if a motor is more efficient, you save energy. It's a literal advantage. But even in applications where we are only running it for short periods of time, etc., where the energy saving will not be significant, even there people are realizing that there are many advantages to having more efficient motors. A more efficient motor means essentially it will generate less heat. So uh, you can have longer periods of uninterrupted operation. So like you see in this picture, a kitchen uh, mixer grinder, uh, many of us would have had this experience that if I'm doing a little bit of harsh grinding, then after a few minutes it trips because it's overheating. I have to wait for it to cool down before I start again. So it's a nuisance value. I can avoid that. And uh, uh, because it generates less heat, I don't have to make ports, vents, fans and other arrangements to evacuate the heat. And this means that I can, the appliance can be fully enclosed, everything inside will be well protected. Plus, I don't run the risk of uh, chutney or something spilling and going inside becomes very difficult to clean. And uh, uh, like with all appliances, we want to be ready for when the electricity goes out, we need backup power. So if the motor is more efficient, the uh, sizing of the backup power will also be more affordable. So there are there is more to efficiency than just the literal energy saving. <laughs> so now um, let us look at many of the challenges that are encountered. And these challenges uh, are naturally to be interpreted as opportunities. Um, because if you can address any of the challenges, then we can uh, move to a leadership position. Not just in India. These are challenges across the world. But India has its peculiar challenges too. <laughs> so, many for many materials, including the special alloy called silicon steel that is needed in uh, motors, uh, we are very dependent on imports. Uh, every year we import 4 lakh tons, mostly from Russia, China and Japan. Probably domestically we produce about half lakh tons. So, you can see the percentage. And uh, we recently did some benchmarking of EV uh, car motors. Uh, and uh, we were surprised that 85% of all the losses come from steel. It's not because of the uh, copper. For a lower end vehicles, normally it's the other way around. So it was a little bit surprising and counterintuitive for us. Uh, so the quality of the steel, its uh, alloy composition, etc., is um, uh, I mean, there is a lot of room for improvement. Its performance is much. <coughs> Uh, poorer than what I would like. Uh, so this is one important challenge. The other challenge is with copper, which is another important material. Again, people think that the most expensive material inside a motor is the magnets, because the magnets are rare earth magnets and very expensive on a per kilo basis. That's true. But we actually use a lot more kilos of copper than we do magnet. So actually, in most motors, copper is uh, accounts for a larger portion of the bill of materials than the magnets. <laughs> and um, we produce, here again, our domestic production is very small compared to our annual consumption. And um, the rate at which the use of motors is growing globally, uh, copper is soon going to become very scarce because there is a certain lead time before I can increase my mining capacity and things like that. If I decide today that I want to mine and make uh, more copper, it will probably take um, five, seven years before I start seeing results. But the demand is going to be much ahead of that. So what will happen is that we will have people hoarding um, copper. It will not be available. It will be controlled as a strategic asset. And uh, in the market, the prices will go up and uh, make everything unaffordable. So this is something that I expect will happen in the next uh, year or two. And already US has <coughs> added copper to the list of about 
uh, eight or ten uh, critical uh, raw materials. And uh, <coughs> one endeavor that many companies all over the world are uh, doing is to try to pack more and more copper into the space constraints of um, the motor because when you pack more copper, you lower the resistance, improve the efficiency. How much copper you are able to pack within a given space is called the slot fill. <laughs> and um, uh, I did a simple calculation that today whatever is considered as the maximum limit practically feasible of um, slot fill, if I could increase that by about 24 percentage and fill it instead with aluminum, then I will get the same performance as I would get with copper. But the weight of aluminum would be half that of copper and the price will be very small, 15 percent or so. So this is probably the way to um, secure ourselves against an impending uh, shortage of copper. And uh, the most difficult challenge that people have been grappling with for many years now is with magnets <laughs> because rare earth magnets are very powerful. So they enable you to make very efficient and compact motors. Uh, but it's, uh, they are not only expensive, but almost entirely controlled by China. So it's a strategic risk, a lot of price volatility and you know, due to various factors beyond your control, things can become unavailable, lead times can get long. It's not possible to plan uh, anything on the basis of rare earths. So <laughs> the commonly known alternative uh, magnet is called the ferrite magnet, but it is three times weaker. If it is three times weaker, it means that you have to, in a literal uh, sense, you have to put three times more current to get the same amount of performance. <coughs> and uh, just as current interacting with the magnetic field produces uh, torque, in the same way current interacting with the steel in the rotor uh, can also produce torque and that's called reluctance torque. So by some clever design, if I can combine the talk from the ferrite magnet and augment it with talk from the steel called the reluctance torque, I can come somewhat closer to the performance that a rare earth magnet um, motor would give me. And uh, taking this to its logical conclusion, I can entirely get rid of magnets and depend only on the interaction between the current and the steel. So these are all different topologies that people are trying. Uh, well, in all these cases, <coughs> whatever we uh, get rid of by way of magnet, we will have to compensate by putting more copper, more steel, make it a little bulkier. Uh, it is not even obvious that overall the, there will be a significant reduction in the cost. But yes, the uncertainty and risk associated with the availability of rare earth can be eliminated. The reason uh, why this is a uh, technologically uh, more challenging uh, route to take is because the properties of steel are very, very nonlinear and when I subject it to the influence of magnetic fields, its behavior becomes <coughs> more and more uh, difficult to predict and control. So it is difficult to develop good control algorithms for controlling these magnets, uh, these magnet-free motors. So there is a lot of work along the way, but uh, it will be quite some distance before we get performance that is good and comparable to uh, the normal rare earth uh, based motors. <coughs> so in that context, there seems to be one very um, promising development. A com company in the US has uh, made uh, magnets that are as strong as rare earth magnets, but it only uses iron and nitrogen, which is abundantly available. And uh, they are backed by investors led by General Motors, etc. And I think they have just started shipping out evaluation samples. So something like this <coughs> would be very good for the industry if it uh, happens. And um, perhaps people like us should work on more such alloys and come up with other alternatives. And uh, the other approach that people are taking around this magnet problem is Okay, you can't get rid of rare earth magnet, try to at least use less of it. So you have on the right hand side uh, a design on the top showing the red lines which are all the rare earth magnets in the motor and the picture below 
is one where I use less than half of the rare earth magnet and I'm augmenting it with some of those blue lines which are ferrite magnets. So, <laughs> and then similarly I can change the entire geometry of the motor into what is called an axial flux where I can get the same performance in a significantly reduced uh, size which means I'll use less of magnets as well as less of copper and steel. So, these are all um, some of the approaches. The other important problem is with volume manufacturing, motors as a technology of in manufacturing sense, they matured many decades ago uh, when the volumes were not uh, very large. So suddenly now if I have to scale up the volumes, the existing methods are very ill suited. Although people say that you know an EV has very few moving parts, the motor has only one moving part. It's true only if you consider motor as one component. If you open up the motor, it has hundreds of parts. There are lots of thin laminations which are to be stacked and wires are to be wound. Um, you have to varnish to insulate it, whole lot of steps and any one step going wrong and you suffer the risk of burnout. <laughs> so it is not a very easy to scale uh, method. There are uh, uh, alternative approaches where you can mold the uh, steel components using powdered steel. The problem with that is that the powdered steel is very expensive. Uh, then you can print the stator uh, directly on a PCB. This is not really a very novel idea. For those of you who are old enough to know what a floppy drive is, all those drives were powered by uh, printed uh, uh, stators. But for higher loads, there is a lot of engineering to be done to be able to handle higher loads. And uh, <coughs> of course, in terms of power electronics, uh, we hardly make any of the components involved. We also don't even make the testing instruments and other things. Uh, so beyond designing a system and integrating the components, um, there is uh, very little, I really don't know uh, what we can do to uh, uh, break this particular challenge. And uh, lastly, I don't know how much time I have. Um, I'll go through just three or four slides to show what are the trends people are doing in electric vehicles. The most uh, initially, the most uh, attractive part of an electric vehicle was that you could just fit the entire engine, which means the motor inside a wheel, what are called in-wheel motors. <laughs> and then you had uh, people trying to bring more and more things inside the wheel. Uh, on the left, uh, you have an attempt by Michelin to bring in the suspension inside it. More recently, Hyundai and Kia have tried to bring the entire gearing, gearing inside the wheel. And um, you want to do everything with no mechanical movement, only through communication by signals. Um, so you can <laughs> make the motor act as the engine. You can also make the motor act as a brake. You can use motors for steering the vehicle. Um, you can do suspension, whole lot of things. And uh, another uh, uh, evolving trend is that you don't have just one motor, but you have independent motors, one for each wheel. You have the advantages of a four wheel drive. <laughs> In addition, with good uh, software, you can have very sharp turns. And at slower speeds, you can even do a zero turning radius, 90 degree turn, etc., which is good for parking or in cramped warehouses. So that's called torque vectoring. <coughs> and uh, there's a company called Lucid who have uh, developed a way of weaving the entire winding, rolling it like a carpet, and it can just be inserted in a motor. So this uh, takes away a lot of headache associated with conventional winding methods, and you get a near 100% slot fill. Um, and um, they have also um, made the shaft hollow and put the differential inside it. So in that single package, you have everything from the motor to the gearbox. So that's about it. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, sir. So one question. Quick question. One question. One question. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Professor, for that insightful session. You mentioned about magnet-free motors, which reluctance motors. Uh, there are companies now, you know, such as SMC, uh, which is now called Turntate in the US, who are claiming that switch reluctance motor is at least 50% more efficient than their normal ICE motors. Yeah. Um, see, efficiency is one metric. And uh, it's one number which comes from a particular combination of speed and torque. The problem is not actually with efficiency. Yes, SR motors can be very efficient. But can you control them across the entire operating range of different speeds and torques without ripples, 
uh, without losing control, etc. That's where the challenge is because steel is a very non-linear material in its properties. Thank you, Professor. I